Hi everyone and welcome to Rutgers Geology Museum's Ask a Geologist web series. So today um, we have a good friend of mine, Michael Monzon, who is a master's student at Rutgers University in the Department of Entomology. And he is going to be talking about invertebrate extinctions today. So without further ado, go ahead, Michael, and take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'm a master's student here at uh, Rutgers University um, in the Department of Entomology. So entomology is a fancy way of saying bugs. And even though not all entomologists um, study bugs specifically, some study spiders and some study worms, um, most entomologists study bugs. And that's, that's what I study specifically. Um, I look at forensic entomology. So I study bugs that decompose meat, and I also look at bugs that are found in um, archeological sites. So bugs that might be found in tombs or on mummies, fun stuff like that. But today we're going to talk about some past invertebrates and uh, how some of them became extinct. But before we jump right into invertebrate extinctions, I want to define what an invertebrate is and what extinction is. So scientists will define extinction as when the last member of a species dies or when the remaining members of that species can no longer make offspring. So for example, if you have a population or a group of dragonflies and there are only five of those dragonflies left, they're still alive, but if they're too old to lay eggs, then scientists will consider that species extinct. So scientists, uh, can't really say in the moment when the exact time of extinction occurs, but what scientists usually do is they'll look back in time and they'll say, okay, well, the last time this animal was, saw, was seen was 20 years ago and no one has seen it since, so, uh, and there's no evidence that it no longer is here. So we'll estimate that that animal became extinct 20 years ago. So talking about extinction is usually looking back and trying to determine when that animal disappeared from the earth. And so um, animals usually go extinct through two main ways. Either there will be a mass extinction event. Um, an example of this would be uh, the meteor that we believe uh, ended the time of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So that meteor impact and the um, environment that it created is what we consider a mass extinction event. Um, also, climate change can cause extinction as well. So we live on a dynamic planet, and what that means is that our our planet is always changing. So um, sometimes those changes aren't always good for the animals that live in that habitat. Um, and if those animals can't move or adapt, they may die out. And we're going to see an example of, of that later with some pretty big dragonflies. So scientists usually say that most of the animals that ever lived on Earth has gone extinct. And that may seem kind of weird or, or kind of sad, but when we look at all of the animals that have ever lived on Earth, the animals that we see today are only a small number of all of the animals that have ever lived. And so we're going to look at some of those animals that, um, that used to live on Earth, but don't exist today. But what exactly is an invertebrate? So we're talking about invertebrate extinctions today, but an invertebrate is an animal that does not have a backbone or a spine. 
Also, an invertebrate can either be soft bodied or have a hard exoskeleton. Some examples of invertebrates are arthropods like in mollusks like our uh, blue ringed octopus right here, annelids like earthworms and nidarians like jellyfish. So as we can see here, we have two different animals that look very similar, but they are not the same. On our left, we have um, an African giant millipede, which is one of the largest species of millipedes on Earth today. And on the right, we have a pine wood snake, which um, is native to the um, to here in North America. So both of these animals are around the same size. They're very similar in color, but one has a hard exoskeleton and no uh, no backbone, that would be the millipede, and the other has a soft outer body, but it does have a backbone, and that's the snake. So even though animals may sometimes look very similar, they um, are actually quite different when you look at how their um, organs and how their bodies are structured. So arthropods are a specific type of invertebrate. The word arthropod comes from Latin, meaning jointed foot. So that is a very common, um, very common thing with arthropods. Almost basically all of them have these jointed feet. We'll take a look at that a little closer in a second. So um, generally speaking, arthropods have exoskeletons, and that is the hard outer shell that covers a horseshoe crab or an insect. So their muscles are attached to the inside of, of those exoskeletons. Our skeleton is on the inside and our muscles attach to it on the inside. So it's a little bit of the opposite when it comes to arthropods. So um, examples of arthropods would be our horseshoe crab right here and millipedes. So as we can see from this picture, all of the things circled in um, yellow are jointed body segments. And those body segments are, are uh, when they come together at their joints, are what allow arthropods to move. So um, the name arthropod means jointed leg or jointed foot. And as you can see from the um, horseshoe crabs uh, feet, they're circled in yellow uh, circles and ovals, that they are a series of joints all connected together. So then what is an insect? An insect is a type of arthropod. Insects have th um, six legs. If it's more than six, it is not an insect. Insects also have three body regions. We can see that from this picture, the head at the top, the thorax in the middle, and the abdomen at the end. Um, insects also go through a metamorphosis. This is a complete metamorphosis, like with a butterfly or a dragonfly, or it is an incomplete metamorphosis, like with many grasshoppers, where the baby looks like a tiny little itty bitty version of the adults. Our fly right here goes through complete metamorphosis. And so the fly babies or larvae uh, look like worms. We call them maggots. So let's now, now that we know what ex extinction is and what an invertebrate is, let's jump right into our invertebrate extinctions. So the first main, the first major time that um, we see invertebrates all over the world is during the Cambrian era. So that was about 540 to 520 million years ago. It's a long time. And scientists have called this time the Cambrian explosion. And that's because before this time period, there were a few animals in the fossil record, but there wasn't a lot to study. All of the sudden, during the Cambrian era, animals, fully formed animals, can be found all throughout the world in the fossil record. 
scientists aren't exactly sure what led to this, but it is still extremely interesting. And so a lot of those animals that are from the Cambrian era were found in a type of rock called shale rock. So shale is a type of sedimentary rock. So what happens is um, layers of mud or dirt build up on top of each other, covering the animal, and that's how fossilization takes place. Um, and so many of those animals that we see during the Cambrian era, they are closely related to today's mollusks like scallops or clams or today's crustaceans like shrimp. And so we see this little critter right here. Um, its name or the scientists, the, the name the scientists gave to it is Waptia. And it is very similar to today's shrimp. But as you can see, it has this shell part um, called a carapace, similar to a turtle. Um, it's carapace that is covering or protecting part of its body and its head. So um, the today's shrimp don't really have that. And uh, but other parts of its body uh, are very similar to shrimp, which allowed scientists to make the connection. So this is one of my favorite animals of the Cambrian era, Hallucigenia. It's named that because when scientists found its fossils in the shale, they thought they were imagining things. So Hallucigenia was a type of worm that lived in water and it had this knob-like head. It had this knob-like head and a series of long spikes that came off of its back. And so here are some artist drawings of what they believe hallucigenia looked like. Now, scientists work with these artists to explain to them how they want these pictures drawn so they will be the most accurate picture that the scientist believes the animal looked like. So um, we scientists believe that the hallucigenia was an ancient ancestor of today's velvet worm. Now, here's the funny thing. We don't have any living hallucigenia today. So they did go extinct, but scientists aren't exactly sure why they went extinct. There's no evidence of a mass extinction event, and there's no evidence that climate change drove them to extinction. So perhaps it is possible that a gradually changing world, a world that changed a little bit over time, caused hallucigenia and its offspring to adapt and change possibly evolving into today's velvet worm, which is very similar to hallucigenia. So even though this animal is extinct, um, it may not have been because of climate change or event, it may be because of evolution. So that's a theory that some scientists have. So now we're gonna move up in time to about 359 million years ago, still a really long time ago. And this is the Carboniferous period. So the Carboniferous period is um, what we would call the time of oxygen. And that's because there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. And that is what scientists believed allowed two species, specifically Arthropleura and Meganura, to get as big as they did. And so Arthropleura was a millipede that some species grew to be up to eight feet long. And here we can see um, an artist drawing of two different species of Arthropleura next to um, about uh, a, a, a drawing of an adult that's a little under six feet tall. So um, we have here, um, a smaller species of Arthropleura that, even though it's smaller, it's still about as long as a human foot, up to the largest species of Arthropleura, which was over eight feet long and definitely longer than any person is tall. So 
Now we are looking at, on the left, this is a fossil of Arthropleura, and on the right is the artist's rendition of what it looked like. So they lived in ancient forests where they fed on vegetation, decaying plants, and, and possibly scavenged small animals. So in nature, um, sometimes a plant eater won't always strictly be a plant eater because animals need to eat whatever they can find. So other fossils, um, I don't have a picture of it here, but other fossils we have of Arthropleura um, show their, their footprints. So we have marks in the mud of where their feet tracks were. Um, and so this specimen is pretty well documented throughout the world in the fossil record. Uh, I mentioned dragonflies before, and so this is our only true insect on our list, but it's a pretty impressive one. Meganeura was a dragonfly that had a wingspan of over two feet. So um, <clears throat> we see this artist diagram right here. And so the Meganeura is about as wide as a, a human adult. Um, and again, we have some artist rendition of what Meganeura looked like in its natural habitat next to a uh, fossil, a full fossil of a Meganeura specimen. So these animals lived near water, near streams or uh, large lakes, and they were hunters. So they are uh, um, carnivorous predators that would catch other insects, um, amphibians like frogs, and possibly even small vertebrates like snakes and um, snakes and lizards. And so uh, a dragonfly has very powerful wings and um, they're able to use that to fly over long distances, fly over bodies of water to hunt their prey. So our last, um, our last uh, time period that we're going to explore is the Permian-Triassic extinction event. And now that event happened about 252 million years ago. And that event wiped out the trilobites. So we can see a fossil of a trilobite over here uh, on the right. And judging by these fossils, scientists believe that there were many different species of trilobites. So trilobites lived on Earth for about 300 million years. So they are considered to be one of the most successful animals to ever inhabit the earth. And now we can see that there were many different species and those species had different lifestyles. So some um, were in the sea as predators, some were scavengers. Some were filter feeders that fed on plankton, similar to baleen whales today. And scientists theorize that some trilobites even made the jump to partially living on land, which is very impressive. Now, scientists believe that a mass extinction event is responsible for the extinction of the trilobites but we're not exactly sure what that event was. Some scientists think that a meteor struck northern, uh, northern Russia, changing the composition of the atmosphere, which then affected the chemical composition of the sea. Some other scientists think that the event started in the sea and that large vents opened up in the Earth's crust, spewing large amounts of gases into the ocean, changing the chemical composition of the ocean, and in turn, affecting the chemical composition of the atmosphere as well. Some scientists have a few other theories as to what event it was that caused the Permian-Triassic extinction event. But one thing that scientists do agree on usually is that the event caused the acidification of the ocean. Once the oceans became really acidic, two things started to happen. One, animals that had shells 
exoskeletons like our trilobite, they were unable to make and keep healthy their exoskeleton. So their exoskeleton was being damaged by the chemicals in the water and that led to their death. The other, the other thing scientists believe is that the acidification of the ocean led to um, digestive problems with the ocean animals. So animals like trilobites could no longer digest, digest properly and it was um, problems with their digestion and stomach issues that that eventually led to their um, led to their extinction. Um, so, trilobites have made it into our popular culture. If anybody is familiar with um, first generation Pokemon, it is believed that uh, Kabuto was the inspiration for, I mean, trilobites were the inspiration for the Pokemon Kabuto. Now, um, I suppose I will let you make your own uh, d decision about that, but I believe that they look pretty similar. So a lot of times I get asked, why does this matter? Why does, and why should we study animals that no longer even live on the earth? What can that tell us? I believe it can tell us a lot. So as I mentioned before, I mentioned the word dynamic. Our planet is a dynamic planet, meaning that the surface of the earth and the climate is always changing. So we need to understand how animals survived and adapted in um, past environments. And that will give us a clue as to you know, what may happen in the future if and when our Earth starts to change. Um, the second reason is that uh, Mother Nature is the best designer. And a lot of times people will look to animals and the natural world and see how animals have adapted to, um, to live in harsh conditions. And then designers and engineers will take the, those um, mechanisms, will take those things that make those animals special and find a way to incorporate that into our machines. And so um, as time goes on, we're getting better and better at doing this. And so by looking at how ancient animals adapted, we're going to be able to build better machines and better technology. And finally, ancient ecology. Um, if we look at this picture over here on the right, this was a teeny tiny little insect that lived in the feathers of dinosaurs. Up until a few years ago, we had no idea that this insect even existed until a bunch of specimens were found preserved in amber. So this is giving us a better picture of how the ecosystem worked in the ancient times, right? So we didn't just have dinosaurs that had feathers, but there were also parasites, maybe even they were symbiotic, but we also had an, uh, little insects that lived inside of the feathers of dinosaurs. So that means that when the dinosaurs went extinct, not only them, but possibly these insects that lived in the dinosaur feathers went extinct as well. So by studying ancient insects, we are better able to have a fuller understanding of ancient nature. So I think we are going to move on to the uh, question period of our, um, of our presentation. Give me one second. So we had some folks submit some questions and we are going to go through them right now. So um, Mary from Scotch Plains wants to know, were there insects that lived entirely underwater in the early stages of Earth? That's a very good question. So I do not know, I personally do not know of any specific insects, insect species that lived entirely in water. However, 
a lot of our ancient arthropods solely lived in water. So we have our trilobites. They were almost all, many species lived entirely in water. We looked at hallucinogenia, that animal lived entirely in water. And um, we looked at, uh, and we saw a little bit of that creature, Waptia, and Waptia was like an early shrimp, and they lived completely in water. None of those are insects, but they are closely related. Um, Meganura, the giant dragonfly, uh, dragonfly larvae are aquatic, so they do live in water for part of their life. Most insects aren't going to spend the entire life cycle in water, and um, very few insects live in the marine environment. So as the, um, there's only, uh, I don't know its name, but there is, I think, one species of beetle that lives in brackish marsh water. So you're not really going to find any insects in the marine world, but um, you will find some that live a lot of their life in, um, in like fresh water. Um, so water striders, uh, scientific name, halobabies are other are, are insects that will spend their entire life in water. So uh, that's actually a good, good point right there. Um, so another question from Mary is, um, Um, do we think the earliest animals like dragonflies use the same methods to find or repel rivals at, um, as they do today? So dragonflies are actually um, one of the oldest insects that we have, and their behavior is studied pretty extensively. Um, we're not able to, to, we're not really able to make really concrete decisions about animal behavior from ancient times. But what we can do is we can look at their living relatives and then we can look at how their bodies have changed. So in science, we often say that um, form follows function, right? So that a design that um, nature will, will um, make it so that an animal's body will adapt to what it needs to do. So we can have some clues about animal behavior um, by how its bodies are structured. So dragonflies are very aggressive. Today's dragonflies are, are very aggressive um, in their mating and in their defending, uh, fending off their territory from rivals. So um, it is most likely that they exhibited a similar behavior in the past. But um, because we cannot observe that behavior, most scientists don't feel comfortable saying definitely yes or definitely no. Um, so Ria's mom would like to know, um, are there some common factors that led to past invertebrate extinctions? So um, a changing habitat is definitely a big, um, a big factor that seems to be a pretty consistent theme throughout the uh, extinction events. So we had the Permian-Triassic extinction, which was, uh, which scientists do believe when it was an extinction event, but that extinction event led to the destruction of um, the animal's habitat. So I would say, in my, in my opinion, um, a big similarity in extinction events is the destruction of an animal's habitat. So um, we look at beetles, and it seems that with beetles, many of the species that existed in ancient, ancient, ancient times, like millions of years ago, still exist today. And that might be, scientists think, because they are smaller and very mobile. So beetles have usually have wings, they're able to fly. And so insects are very good at sensing changes in their environment. And so 
scientists theorize that beetles are able to figure out when the environment is no longer good for them. And so they can pick up, leave, and then figure out where the, where the next habitat is that best fits what they need. Um, I would say a habitat destruction with an animal's inability to leave and find a new habitat are, are big themes in um, in um, ex insect extinction, arthropod or um, invertebrate extinctions in general. And so the follow up question to that are. Um, what are some major evolutionary advantages or adaptations that invertebrates went, went through? So two of the adaptations I believe invertebrates have that allow them to um, not become extinct are flight. So in most, most terrestrial insects have the ability to fly. And so they can easily leave one habitat for another. Um, an insect's metabolism uh, or arthropods metabolism also may play a very large role in how they're able to adapt. So, um, for example, if you have a wasp problem at your house, if you have a wasp infestation, sometimes you need to use a special bug spray just for wasps. And that's because um, it, insects and many arthropods have adapted this very fast metabolism where their bodies are able to process and push out toxins and contaminants very quickly. So those two things, um, the ability to fly and the ability to metabolize and get rid of toxins and wastes very quickly, are probably are probably um, the two adaptations I think are probably most important for insects being able to to survive. Um, Julie would like to know what is my favorite group of insects and why. <sighs> wow, that's a really hard question. There's so many insects I love. So um, I I got into um, into insects entomology through agriculture. And in agriculture, there is an insect called a green lacewing fly or green lacewing. And um, I think they're very cute. And their larvae are predators. And so they are very good at um, eating bad insects in farms. So farmers really like them. Um, I also really like honeybees, um, and that's because um, honeybees are very fascinating. So they have a very collectivist structure within their hive. Um, the, the hive is of the utmost importance, and so individuals within the hive are willing to make themselves a little uncomfortable so that um, the hive can be as healthy as possible. Bees also have their own way of communication called a waggle dance. It's a little complicated, but bees are actually able to use a special dance to tell other bees exactly where to find food. And so this, <clears throat> this um, dance can be so specific that we're talking like, we're talking like how to find like one specific patch of flowers. And so scientists are only recently trying to um trying to figure out like how how bees are able to to do this because it's, it's very impressive and um there's also evidence to suggest that bees are able to retain some kind of memory and and make some level of intelligent decisions and so you know if you have a brain that's really 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 tiny and has a lot fewer nerves and cells that our brain has, yet they're able to make, you know, um, intelligent decisions is, is very impressive. And so that's something scientists are looking into. Um, what kind of bugs primarily live in water? 
So um, we mentioned before our water strider, and that is a type of insect that is able to use the surface tension of the water to walk on the water. What do I mean by surface tension? So if you ever take a glass and you fill it with water up to the brim, right? That water will stay hovering at the brim and won't spill over sometimes. And so that ability for water to do that is called surface tension. So in so water shiders are able to use the surface tension to um to um walk along the water. Also, there are insects like um Trichoptera, that name means um hair wing, right? So if you look at their wings, there, there are these, they look like almost most people would maybe call them a moth or a fly. I would call them a trichoptera. Um, so if you look really closely, their distinct um, markings are their little hairs on their wings, but their larvae are aquatic. And so what their larvae do is very fascinating. They actually make these little cocoons for themselves out of rocks and sticks and, and pieces of plant matter. And so, um, if you're interested, um, what some artists have started to do is they've started to raise Trichoptera inside of their studios and give them little flecks of gold and gems and jewels. And the, and the Trichoptera will actually make their cocoons out of gold and gems. And it's very fascinating. Um, other animals, I mean, other insects that live in the water uh, would be like predaceous diving beetles. So there are beetles that are carnivores that dive and, and mostly live in the water. Um, Garrids, that's the scientific name um, for, the, for that group. I'm not sure um, what the common name is. And then there are actually a bunch of spiders that live in the water as well. And so there are certain hunting spiders that are capable of um, diving for long periods of time and catching small catching insects and even small fish sometimes so that's pretty um pretty impressive so another question we have is um what kind of chemicals would have made the ocean harsh for these for these creatures so i i do believe Maybe I get some help here. Um, I do believe that um, it was acidification in the form of, I believe it was methane that scientists believe was released into the um, released into the oceans that caused acidification. And then what actually happened is, I believe it was calcium carbonate um, is a a chemical in many marine animals shells or exoskeletons and so the acidification caused the calcium carbonate to break down in their shells um but the actual chemicals i'm not sure exactly what um all of the chemicals are that cause the acidification or cause uh, the mass the extinction event of the permian triassic extinction um and I do believe that's something that uh, maybe like you, we would look at um, ice cores. So we would look at places like Antarctica where there is a lot of um, thick ice. And so what scientists can do is they can drill those, drill down, take long ice cores, and then cut them into thin slices and then look at what chemicals are found in them at the different times and we're able to determine what the atmospheric um, chemical makeup was at that time. So I'm sorry I don't have a very definitive answer for you, but um, some scientists do believe it was methane being released into the ocean through vents, but there is controversy. There is um, multiple theories about this. Um, so another question is, I had mentioned that I had mentioned archaeology and entomology. What kind of bugs are found in tombs? That is a great question. I could talk about this for a very long time. But the short answer is, 
beetles are going to be the most common insect type that are found in um, in tombs. And so there's a few reasons for that. Number one, um, there are many species of beetles that are specifically adapted into getting into buried environments. So we have insects, we have beetles that naturally are able to find and then colonize buried um, buried bodies, buried decomposing meat, or as we call carrion. Um, and so these beetles that are able to find the buried carrion are often able to get into um, tombs. So um, the, generally it's going to be beetles and then depending on what location in the world you are at, and what time of year that tomb was sealed is going to help us um, is going to help us determine facts about that tomb. So, um, you know, if you are in, looking at a tomb in Peru, um, the beetle species that you find are going to indicate what time of year that tomb was was sealed or if it was reopened. Um, fly larvae, well, fly pupa are also pretty common. So we know that a um, butterfly will turn into a chrysalis, which is a type of pupa, and then from there the butterfly emerges. And flies go through, house flies, or, you know, the, the flies we saw earlier, go through a similar process. So they are hatched from eggs as maggots, as worms, then they grow to be a bigger maggot, and then they'll turn into a pupa. And from that pupa, the fly emerges. We don't say hatch, we say emerge. So um, a lot of times in ancient tombs, we will find fly pupa. So the little, sh the little shell of, the, um, of its chrysalis or, or pupa. And so if we find those, we are able, some scientists are sometimes able to say um, what, how many times, what time of year the person died, how many times the tomb was opened. And so um, when looking at ancient insects in tombs and archaeology sites, you can't just look at one or even a, a couple um, insect specimens, you have to take everything you find, analyze it together, and the um, entirety of the evidence you collect is going to um, paint a picture for you. So um, our next question is related, and um, are there bugs that help preserve archaeological artifacts? So helping to preserve, I'm not exactly familiar with anything that helps to preserve. However, um, it could actually help to, uh, I mean, not help, but insects could actually destroy um, some archaeological uh, artifacts and findings. So for example, um, there were um, bread products, ancient bread, ancient crackers found from a grain storehouse in ancient Egypt that scientists were able to excavate. But here's the problem. If that ancient bread isn't kept in a very specific room that's cold and dry, it is very easy for insects to then find that ancient bread and start to break it down. We also have evidence that um, through time and chemical changes, that there is sometimes a chemical reaction that happens between a beetle's exoskeleton and uh, metal artifacts. So there are times where archaeologists have found um, Viking swords, they have found uh, iron statues, and when they look really closely, they found imprints of beetles on those artifacts. And some of those imprints were so clear, they were actually able to figure out what species of beetle those are, those were from. 
So um, that actually gives us uh, more insight into um, the insects of those past. And um, uh, what that environment looked like when those ancient people had built that tomb to begin with. Is it possible to extract the DNA of dinosaurs from bugs stuck in amber, like Jurassic Park? So, uh, surprisingly, I do believe that that um, similar work to this is being done right now in one of the Carolinas. Um, actually, this past week, so this past this past week they did actually um, um, announce that a dinosaur embryo was created with the use of some chicken DNA, but that that wasn't from that wasn't extracted from um, insects. That was extracted from um, they found a fossil that still had some soft tissue within the fossil, and that's where they got that DNA. I don't know if it'll ever be possible to do that only because um, once the amber hardens around the insect, I think it's possible for, um, I think it is possible for some of that, um, some of the the chemical composition of what's inside of the insect to become degraded now i'm not this is not exactly i actually should have been prepared with this answer this is probably one of the the number one questions i should have anticipated um as of right now that is not how we would choose to get dinosaur dna um there are other ways we can get dinosaur dna um, mainly through fossils that still have some soft tissue um, incorporated into it, but perhaps in the future um, we we might be able to do that. And so, let's see our next question. Um, Can you use extinct bugs to study past climate conditions? So I, I believe that there is value to using extinct animals to study past climate conditions, but we can't just look at a fossil and, and try to make um, decisions about what the climate conditions were. So, so trying to use bugs to look at ancient, ancient climate conditions is going to be what we call an interdisciplinary uh, research study. So interdisciplinary means that you're going to have lots of different scientists from lots of different fields all coming together to help each other answer one question. So that question might be, do ancient arthropods tell us about past climate conditions? So you might have someone, you might have one member of a team who does look at the body parts in the fossils of ancient insects. You might have another person on the team who studies those ice cores I mentioned from Antarctica, looking at what, um, what is going to be the composition of the ancient, um, the ancient uh, atmosphere. Then you also might have someone like Rhea, who is um, a geological, uh, so studies um, the ocean from a geologic standpoint, right? So then you'll have that person um, looking at the changes that the ocean went through. And so all of these people together are going to um, come together to make a determination about these past climate conditions. So I would say that, yes, you can use ancient arthropods to study past climate, but um, it's going to be one piece in a larger puzzle. And we have to put together, a bunch of scientists have to come together to put that puzzle together. So Cole would like to know, um, if some trilobites did live on land for part of their lives, were they not affected by the change in water quality? Did they survive? 
So trilobites um, may have, so scientists believe that trilobites may have crawled up onto land in tidal flats. Tidal flats are the coastal areas where, you know, there is land at low tide and um, it's mostly covered by water during high tide. So um, it's not believed that um, they ventured very far into land. They still needed to primarily live in the water. So any major changes in water chemistry would still have, most likely still have a huge impact on the trilobites, causing them to go extinct. So that is a really, really good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so uh, we have, why did I decide to go into entomology? Um, I kind of ended up in entomology by accident. Um, I started in agriculture and to finish my agriculture degree at Rutgers, I needed to um, do a hands-on summer project, what we call a summer practicum. Um, so most people in my program worked at the student organic farm, like being farmers, um, for that summer for the practicum. I um, lucked out, and the semester before that started, I took a class called agricultural entomology. I did really well in the class, I made a very good impression on the teacher and afterwards he invited me to apply for a program that Rutgers runs called IPM or integrated pest management. So what IPM is, is when you have pest professionals go to farms and they really look to see if there are any um, major infestations in the farm, and then we use our findings um, in a math equation, and then that math equation tells us when would be the best time to use pesticides. In the past, in agriculture, farmers would reach a certain time in the growing season and then automatically just start spraying, spraying, spraying pesticides once a week, every week until, you know, harvest came close. Um, with integrated pest management, you're having a person who knows insect damage go out into the field and visually inspect it. So um, what happens as a result is that um, Farmers then only need to use pesticides when they really need it. And so Rutgers' IPM program has allowed the farmers that participate in it to reduce their spraying by about 70%. So that's very, very um, impressive. And that's good for people because, you know, we all want our food to be sprayed as little as possible. And it's good for the farmers too, because they're being exposed to it less. And those pesticides are very expensive. So that saves the farmer a lot of money too. And so uh, our last question here is, um, have I ever traveled anywhere cool for my research? So um, this past, year, I've been doing a project in Philadelphia, where um, in 2017, 2018, a um, colonial era graveyard was found in the middle of Philadelphia. No one knew it was there. But when they were doing construction, um, they found all these coffins. So what I'm doing is I'm working with the researchers who are archaeologists who excavated that site. And I am um, taking soil samples from inside of the coffins, and I'm pulling out all of the tiny little insect bits. So someone before asked what, what um, insects are most likely found in archaeological sites. And one thing I did not mention was that usually in an archaeology site, you're not going to find a whole insect. You're going to find a leg here, uh, a head there, right? Uh, part of an exoskeleton, another leg. And so you have to collect all of these tiny little bug bits 
look at them under a microscope and determine exactly which insects you are looking at. And so um, I went to Philadelphia a bunch of times for that research. That's pretty cool. I've gotten to go to Arizona to work with uh, one of my mentors who is a professor at Arizona State University. That was awesome. And this year, I am working on a grant that would allow me to go to Sweden and work with a um, very accomplished um, archaeological entomologist over there. So um, hopefully that will work out. Um, but if anybody is interested in archaeological entomology, I would love to come back and tell you more. Uh, I think that's all the questions I have. Yeah, so that's all the questions. Um, thank you so much, Michael. You did an amazing job and I learned a lot. That was very cool. Um, so this is actually our last web series um, for the summer, but we will be back in the fall semester. So thank you to everyone who joined us today and in the previous sessions too. Um, we will be back in the fall. So just uh, keep an eye out for that announcement. And Michael, thank you once again. Um, and Hey. Thanks everyone for coming.